the walrus. Weighing in at around one and a half tons and over three meters long, this massive marine mammal spends most of its time frolicking around the Arctic. So when archaeologists discovered the bones of one in a coffin in an old London cemetery, well, it caused quite a splash. In the early 2000s, a big new extension to bring the Eurostar rail service to London's St Pancras station was underway. To make way for these epic 400 metre long trains, extensive platforms had to be built and in their path was a section of the sprawling, disused burial ground of St Pancras Old Church. So these works took place in 2002 and 2003, and the organisation I used to work for assembled a multidisciplinary team of um, field archaeologists and specialists, including um, specialists at the Museum of London, to meet the requirements of this complex and uh, challenging project. Phil was head of the team of archaeologists who unearthed this strange discovery. They were in the process of recording hundreds of old burials when they reached one that left them rather perplexed. So in this particular coffin, um, we didn't find a, a, an individual skeleton. We've, we found um, remains of human dissection, so um, dissection of human bones, including three skulls that have been subject to cranial autopsy, a sacrum, that is, which is the base of the spine, um, which had been sawn, and um, a sawn lower mandible. So these were remains that had come from the um, work of an anatomist or a surgeon. Alongside those human remains were bones from the left forelimb, left hind limb, and various distal bones, the, the sort of fingers and toes uh, of both sides, of a very large Pacific walrus. We definitely didn't anticipate that in the project design. Now, for a bit of context, St Pancras Old Church was once a small rural parish, sitting outside the reaches of London for hundreds of years. That was until London saw huge expansion in the 18th and 19th centuries. Outbreaks of disease, development and a growing population resulted in the size of St Pancras's burial space swelling to eventually having large extensions to cope with the huge demand of death in its new urban surroundings. The burial ground was closed in 1854, along with many other overcrowded metropolitan churchyards. I was contacted by Alan Pipe, who was working for Museum of London Specialist Services back in it was October 2004. Richard Sabin is Principal Curator of Mammals at London's Natural History Museum. It was one of those calls, emails, that you hope you're going to get in your career, which I did, fortunately, to say that something very unusual, the bones of something very unusual, had been found in a grave with human remains, and they needed to understand what these things were. When Alan brought the box over to me, um, it sat with me on my desk for a day before I took the lid off, but when I took that lid off, and looked inside and saw these huge limb bones. It was fairly obvious to me at the time what I thought they might be, but I rushed down to the marine mammal collection. There are very few um, species within that group, maybe the larger fur seals, elephant seals, and so on, that, that would be of a size that would make me think, you know, this is the species I need to go and examine. But something told me to go and look at the walrus collection. And it was the first group that I looked at and actually that was where the identification was nailed. There is a certain overlap in the range between the Atlantic and the Pacific Wars, and there's probably a little bit of gene flow there. Um, but what we were dealing with was a significantly large animal, probably a male, probably a very aged individual. But it was the, the fact that we had the wars at all which really surprised me. It's absolutely fascinating, this whole idea that something so exotic, such an exotic species, could be found in um, a human grave in that context from that time uh, in London. Absolutely fabulous story. So, how did the walrus bones get there in the first place? Was it some Frankensteinian attempt to create a twisted half-human, half-walrus creature? Or was it something a bit more sensible? I decided to bring Phil and Richard together on a video call to discuss their walrus for the first time in well over a decade. Just who exactly might be responsible? Scientists, biologists, zoologists, artists, 
right across the board have been fascinated by the outside and the more taboo subject of the inside of individuals over the centuries. Now, one of the individuals I've championed is this um, very, very um, eminent late 17th century uh, doctor and anatomist uh, called Edward Tyson. And Tyson was really um, the, the, the first, if you like, the, they, they call him the founder of modern comparative anatomy. Um, of course, comparative anatomy, the study of the similarities and differences of different groups of animals and so on. Doctors would often build their own comparative anatomy collections. And these comparative anatomy collections slowly grew in hospital uh, medical teaching collections, in universities, in museums like the Natural History Museum. Before we opened in South Kensington in 1881, we were the natural history department of the British Museum. And actually the first director of the Natural History Museum, um, Richard Owen, was himself a great uh, anatomist. And, he was not only an anatomist, he was a biologist and a paleontologist, quite famous for coining the word dinosaur. He was able to use his, his observations of living species to help him understand fossils. And this is why he was such a great paleontologist for his time. And that's when the discussion really got interesting. Out of all the potential explanations, could it be a spooky link to the Natural History Museum that holds our answer? But I wonder if I could pick up on, on something that Richard was talking about in terms of Professor Richard Owen. Um, I picked up a reference um, that in 1853, Richard Owen performed a dissection on a walrus that had come from the Zoological Society of London. It had come to them via Captain Von Peterhead, who had been hunting seals up at Svalbard. Now, I know this, is, this makes, you know, this is an Atlantic um, walrus, but I just wondered whether Richard thinks there may be any doubt about the interpretation that it's Pacific walrus. I, I do actually believe that, that there is doubt. In my original reports, didn't actually specify a subspecific designation as either Atlantic or Pacific. I think the only way that we could really um, nail down which of the um, two subspecies this might be is to, to do some DNA analysis, to take a sample from the bones. Um, the other connection I've, I've found was that um, in Owen's employment at the Royal College of Surgeons, when he took over from Clift as the conservator, he was in that situation where he was dealing with the accumulated collections of his predecessor. But the other thing is that in 1835, uh, Owen married Caroline Amelia Clift at St Pancras, <laughs> wow. which, make, which is quite an interesting connection. Now, this, um, is, this is fascinating. These, this, this sort of these commonalities and links which seem to be forming here. One of the books that I do need to take a look at. It's actually something that I have. Is Owen's Anatomy of the Vertebrates, which was, I believe, published in 1862. Now, it's one of the most comprehensive books of its kind. I know that there's a description in that volume of work that relates to the walrus. And maybe, just maybe, looking at all these lines of evidence, all these uh, suppositions, and, and this could be a specimen that Owen examined, had illustrated, which appears in the volume, which might well be, <laughs> who knows, um, the source of the remains that were found in that grave. OK, promising. But is there anything that dates the bones to Richard Owen's time period? We are able to use the dating of the coffins directly below from the coffin plate inscriptions. And we know this coffin dated from between 1822 and 1854. From our three-dimensional model, we can see that the coffin is actually relatively high um, compared to the various burial trenches that were recorded. So it's one of the later mass burials, and that pushes it towards the 1850s, perhaps, which is the date when we have this published account by Richard Owen dissecting a walrus at, at the Royal College of, College of Surgeons. The circumstantial evidence is very strong. Um, it's quite uncanny. It's been wonderful. It's been, it really has been one of the, the, the most enjoyable um, uh, identifications I've been asked to take on in my time at the museum. It's, it's a story that I, I recount 
quite uh, regularly to uh, to people.